What's going on, everybody? And uh, happy Tuesday night to everyone. I uh, hope everybody's doing well out there. Uh, just hopping on tonight to uh, kind of do a recap of what went down this past Pennsylvania at the uh, 45th anniversary, the reunion uh, for Dawn of the Dead at the Living Dead weekend. Um, eventful weekend, a lot going on, a lot going on. I do have some uh, uh, do have some stories and uh, a few news tidbits um, that I was able to gather um, from a few people while I was there. Uh, I got to meet quite a few um, quite a few awesome people for the first time. Um, Grande, specifically, I see you in here, man. Uh, it's definitely, definitely great uh, seeing you and, and hanging out with you on Saturday. Um, sorry, I missed you on Friday. Uh, that Night Riders screening kind of got uh, kind of sat up front and just kind of got immersed in the movie. Didn't didn't check my phone too much. So, uh, um, so yeah, it was definitely awesome uh, meeting you on Saturday. Uh, met quite a few uh, quite a few different people. Uh, made some new friends and uh, uh, met met quite a few people that I was uh, really excited to meet. I missed missed one in particular, which I'll get into here in a little bit. And I just have some overall thoughts about uh, uh, about the convention itself. Um, some, uh, you know, maybe a, a few complaints, um, if, if, if I'm allowed um, to air uh, a couple of grievances, um, not just about uh, Living Dead Weekend, um, just about conventions in general. Um, just, I don't know, being there this weekend, it kind of... Uh, I don't know, kind of made me miss the uh, the old days, and uh, I don't know. We'll get into it here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, got there on uh, Thursday night. Uh, that's the night I did uh, the little test stream uh, from my hotel. I was planning on doing at least another one before I left, but uh, <clears throat> the Wi-Fi in that hotel, um, even the deluxe Wi-Fi, which was like five dollars extra per day or something like that. Um, it just wasn't up to snuff for me. Uh, it just wasn't, wouldn't cooperating. And it was a little, little sketchy too, to be honest with you. Um, so I did do, uh, quite a few, um, uh, Romero location shorts, uh, that I posted up, um, Friday got up, went to Evan city to visit the Evan city cemetery. Um, that was the first thing I did Saturday morning. Uh, what time I got up? It was fairly early by the time I, I, I got there. It was probably 9, 10 o'clock, something like that, uh, which is early for me, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I got to uh, Evan City on uh, Friday morning, did a few location, uh, location videos there at the uh, cemetery, and then a couple downtown, which is pretty much that entire downtown area is where they pretty much shot most, if not all, of the crazies. Um did some of that. Uh, of course, visited Braddock on Saturday. Um, did a few location videos for that. Uh, visited the Creep Show house. Went back to the airport. Couldn't get to the airport. Um, uh, it, it was pretty pretty roped off. It, it was it would have been pretty hard to get to. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't actually get down to the airport. But I, I did do a short video. Um, where the where the airport entrance used to be, and of course, right down that road is where that big red farmhouse uh, from Dawn of the Dead, where the rednecks and the uh, National Guard are kind of lined up and down the road there. You see that house in the background, and it still pretty much looks exactly the same as it did uh, when that movie came out in 1978, 45 years ago. Um, so that's always a fun location to see in person. But uh, yeah, I don't know. There's. Uh, uh, I'd really like to, on my next trip to Pittsburgh, I'd really like to track down some new locations. I'd been to those locations all before, but just wanted to do some short videos kind of documenting, you know, what they look like in 2023. Um, but there's, that's the thing about Pittsburgh. Uh, that's the thing about going to this convention is there are so many, it's not only the convention, but you're basically surrounded by nothing but Romero locations um, all over Pittsburgh from every movie he made from Night of the Living Dead all the way up to the dark half. Um, and even Land of the Dead, I mean, Land of the Dead, the city in Land of the Dead, it wasn't shot in Pittsburgh, but the city where Land of the Dead takes place is is based on Pittsburgh. So, you know, even just being in Pittsburgh and kind of seeing the layout, um, it kind of it kind of reminds you of Land of the Dead a little bit. So that's pretty cool. Um, 
so yeah, there, there's definitely a, a, quite a few other locations I'd like to like to track down at some point. Um, and I, I think I might do that on uh, my next trip there, whenever that may be. Um, I don't know if it'll be next year or maybe even earlier than that. I'm not sure. But man, it's such a, uh, it's, it's such an expensive trip. Um, you know, especially if you're flying, I, I decided to just rent a car and drive, but, uh, you know, I was looking at just t uh, plane tickets, uh, just flying out of probably Louisville would probably be the closest place that I would fly out of. Um, just Louisville to Pittsburgh is, is, is outrageous. And I'm going to kind of get into more of that here in a little bit, uh, but just conventions overall and, and just how pricey that they've got and how expensive they've gotten. And I mentioned before, you know, if you could easily, if you had the money, you could easily spend uh, a couple thousand bucks at these things, um, especially for somebody like me um, who, you know, could easily spend that kind of money at, at a convention like Living Dead Weekend. <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah, it, it can get a little pricey, um, but we'll get into that a little more, uh, a little bit later. But yeah, Saturday, pretty cool. That was the Night Riders um, screening that night. Um, one complaint that I had about that, it was really, really cool. They, they actually had um, quite a few of the cast and crew members come up um, to discuss the film. Um, before they played it, Christine Romero was up there, Tom Savini, Tasso, uh, Warner Shook, Randy Kovitz, Molly McCloskey. Uh, who else was there? I'm probably missing a couple of people, but uh, but it was cool to see them all, all together, um, kind of a little Night Riders reunion and and uh, and kind of discussing the film and 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 some you know memories. It was it was re really uh pretty interesting to hear Molly McCloskey's um, memories of filming Knight Riders because she she's had some pretty fond memories of, of that time period working with George, um, you know, not only on Dawn of the Dead, but she was also in Knight Riders as well. And she almost started crying at one point. It, it was uh, it was pretty sweet. Um, so, yeah, it was cool uh, hearing from them. And of course, seeing Knight Riders on a, a big screen is, is always is always a joy. Uh, my one complaint, though, is that they kind of the way that the the way that it was laid out, uh, it was in like an old, it looked like an old Hollister or Abercrombie and Fitch store or something like that, that they had set up where you could, you would go, it was the same place where you would go to pick up your tickets and, and your VIP stuff and all that. But when they did that screening, they kind of transformed it to where there was, it was kind of split off into two, well, three separate rooms actually. Um, and you know, I didn't even, this is probably a question with Grande. He was, he was more in the, uh, the mingle party room more than I was. Um, I was kind of there long enough to grab a, a couple of free beers and, and have a seat. Um, but were they playing the, the movie? Um, Cause as we were leaving, I noticed there was another screen in the, uh, in the actual gathering room or wherever. I didn't, I didn't know if they are actually playing the movie or not in there as well. Uh, if I'd have known that I might've checked that out too, but, um, but at points during the film, there was so much commotion and, and so many people kind of hanging out and having a good time in the other room um, that it kind of it kind of got a little too loud where you couldn't. It was kind of distracting from the film. I, I noticed there was a couple of people around me kind of getting a little anxious every time there would be a approach, which, you know, is bound to happen. You get a bunch of uh, crazy Romero fans together in the same room with a bunch of free beer. Uh, go figure. Uh, if you <laughs> if you don't know anything about that, go check out the uh, <clears throat> downstairs uh, outside of uh, outside of the Double Tree uh, at, at you know one o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's you'll it's during that weekend. It's just nothing. I mean, I go down there for a smoke break every now and then. And every time you go out there, there's just a gathering of people just having a good time and, and talking you know horror, Romero, anything and everything. Um, so it's kind of the hangout spot at night. Um, I don't even think most of those people even had a room there. I <laughs> think they would just kind of come show up and hang out and, and go to wherever their hotel was. Um, but yeah, so that, that'd be my one complaint about that. But otherwise than that, it was, it was really, really cool. Uh, one of my favorite parts about that and just kind of that, that, uh, that whole weekend pretty much was just, there was a, there was a kid there, uh, who was kind of cosplaying dressed as George Romero the whole weekend. Um, that was really, really cool. Actually, I think Suze Romero um, posted a picture um, on her Instagram. It's either her Instagram or Facebook or maybe both. Um, 
posted a picture of her with with the kid, you know, dressed as Romero, had the glasses and the scarf and the the vest, and it was kind of a it was kind of a mix of Romero from every generation. You know, he had the the '70s Romero mixed with the more modern Romero that everybody kind of remembers him by now. Um, but it, it was really, really cool to see, you know, and there were quite a few kids um, that were there having a good time. And, and really, uh, and that was really cool to see my buddy, uh, Matt, who I saw on Saturday, I was the first guy I ran into on Saturday at the mall. Um, he was there again this year. This is this was his third year in a row as well. And of course he had his, uh, his, his awesome family there with him, his wife and, and his son. And uh, they do a thing every year. He posted this on Facebook uh, a couple days ago. <clears throat> it's Matt Landrum, everybody, if you want to check him out on Facebook. Uh, another big, big Dawn of the Dead fan uh, and a really, really good dude. Um, he does a thing every year with his son where they run down the hallway from, in the mall from Dawn of the Dead where you see Peter and Roger running down the hallway. Um, he, he recreates that every year uh, with his son. It's It's pretty... Pretty, pretty cool to see. Um, and I, I'm sure it's something really special for him. And that was one thing I was really missing um, uh, uh, the weekend. I was a little homesick uh, at times. There were definitely some times where I was kind of in the dumps. Uh, just missing, you know, my family, um, <clears throat> my fiance, my daughter. And, of course, we just opened our pool this weekend. So that I was seeing pictures of, you know, my, uh, you know, my two and a half year old daughter in the pool swimming, having a good time. And, um so that was, that was one damper on the weekend, really. Um, really got homesick a couple of times there. But, um, but yeah, people just, you know, and of course, they came with me two years ago at the uh, one in 2021. And, and so there was kind of that memory still there of like, oh, I remember when me and, you know, remember me and Everly did this. You know, yeah, my daughter's name is Everly Dawn. Pretty cool, huh? Um. So yeah, that, that was one one little drawback uh, for the weekend. But but yeah, at the Night Rider screening, it was really cool. That kid was there, and he was sitting right in the same row as me with his dad. They were sitting there, and he was just glued to the screen the whole time. Uh, he he had a great time. He apparently that was uh, uh, one of his favorite Romero films in general. Which is I don't even know how old this kid was, but uh, he was definitely young enough to where it'd be pretty uh, impressive that it hit one of his favorite films of all time was Night Rider. So. Um, so that was definitely cool to see. Um, and like I said, there were quite a few kids um, there having a good time, some cosplay and dressed up, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's always a big plus when you see that uh, a younger generation, you know, the, George's legacy continuing to live on and into the into the future with the younger kids as, as us older farts start getting a little older. And, you know, that's one thing, you know, one thing you notice um Two at these conventions that, that that's kind of uh, you know the, the you know these people aren't getting any younger. Um, it's uh, it, it really sinks in your like forty fifth anniversary. Okay, that seems like a long time, but but you know these people aren't gonna be around all the time. And it was really a really really special moment. Uh, Friday, they had a uh, Dawn of the Dead panel with uh, Ken Foray, Galen Ross, and Scott Reiniger. And after the panel, they they had everybody that was involved in Dawn of the Dead, cast, crew, everybody that was there that was involved in Dawn of the Dead, all got together. And this is actually on more, uh, one of my shorts as well, if you want to check it out, if you haven't. Um, <clears throat> they had the whole crew there for a big group photo, and it was just really, really cool to see all of them together again like that. And, uh, and you know, uh, it, and like I said, it, it, you got to really put it into perspective because I remember last year, you know, we, we talked about uh, Nick Tallow um, on, uh, you know, a couple streams ago uh, about this convention, you know, he was there last year and, and, you know, it's, and year goes by and, and he's, he's not at this one and that's bound to happen. That's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, you know, there, I, I, I would almost bet, I would hope it isn't the, the case, but you know, I'd, I'd be pretty willing to bet that the, there's going to be somebody this year who won't be there next year. Um, and, and, you know, who knows five years from now for the 50th anniversary. I hope, uh, you know, I hope that they, that they all are, but um, at some point it really sinks in, you know, you just kind of treasure those moments where you get to see these people all together and, 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 you know, and then having a good time and, and really celebrating the film. And that's, that's the big 
<clears throat> the big reason I like to go to these conventions um, to meet these people, you know, like getting getting autographs and stuff is 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 cool. It's fine, you know. I have, you know, I've, I've spent quite a few bucks on on, a, on some autographs this weekend. Um, but the main reason you you want to, me personally, I I want to meet these people, talk to them. And, and, and just make sure that they understand and make sure that they know how appreciated they are and and how beloved they are by the family. I mean, for God's sakes, there's a whole convention based around, you know, people coming from all over. I mean, there are people from the UK, I know, you know, uh, uh, Daz Sargent, I think he come from the UK. Um, you know, I mean, they, they came from all over the place. I saw there was a guy next to me at one point who had flown from Hawaii to be there. Um, and, and, you know, I, I drove from Evansville, which is nothing compared to what a lot of the people, you know, will go through, um, to do this, <clears throat> but this wouldn't, this would not exist. This would not happen without all of them. Um, you know, yes, George, it was, George is kind of like the, the overseer. He, he, you know, <laughs> to put it in cult terms, he was the kind of leader for, for, for this whole thing. Um. Uh, there, there is kind of a, a bit of a, a cult amongst us Romero fans, um, which I think is really, really special. I don't, I don't know if there are many other directors like that or, you know, filmmakers in general where you could have a, an entire um, an entire you know, you know, convention just based around one filmmaker's work for the most part. Ninety nine percent of it is, you know, um, you know, John Carpenter, I mean, uh yeah, I think they, they do like Halloween specific conventions, um, but there's not just like a, you know, you, you won't go to a Halloween convention and see too many people walking around in, you know, uh, a Ghost of Mars t-shirt or something, you know, but you go to these Living Dead weekends and you see, you know, yeah, you see a lot of Dawn of the Dead stuff, you see a lot of Night of the Living Dead stuff, but and a lot of Day of the Dead stuff as well. <clears throat> um, but you also see, you know, people wearing the t-shirts of the crazies or people wearing t-shirts of, Oh, I saw a guy wearing a uh, bruiser t-shirt uh, at one point, um, which I thought was pretty cool. So you just, you, the, the, it's very, very unique. I mean, there, there's no other, I can't think of one, maybe Kevin Smith or something at some of the stuff he does at like Smod castle and stuff. Um, I guess you could put the, the, the view universe kind of in the, in the same vein, but it's, a uh, <clears throat> it's just, it's really special and really cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yeah, I definitely encourage people to, uh, and, and you just to segue into, uh, another, uh, another topic, um, having to do with conventions, just kind of conventions in general. Like, yeah, I want to, I want to encourage people to go to these shows, especially living dead weekend. Um, <clears throat> if you're a Romero fan, there's really no reason to go. It's like the one time you can just immerse yourself in into this Romero world. Because not only is it a convention where you're surrounded by nothing but like like-minded people having a good time, there to see the same people you're there to see. You know the the endless conversations you can. It's the one weekend you can just have not non-stop conversations about this shit. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the the lone the lone ranger uh you know you know weekends around here you know i got i got friends you know we 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 talk about you know movies of all kinds but i don't have any like just specific romero fans and a lot of the times if i try to go into a romero specific conversation it's like oh okay yeah man yeah yeah there there's no but you know you go to living that weekend you can just throw a rock at somebody pick somebody out of the crowd and say hey what did you think of season of the witch and then you'll get a 20 minute conversation about season of the witch. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, <clears throat> but while I do want to encourage people to go to these and, and just go to conventions in general, um, it, you know, for some reason this year, I guess it's because I, I, I kind of planned on reining myself in a little bit in terms of um, spending and, and, you know, making different purchases and, and stuff like that, because I I'd gone crazy the past couple of years, to be honest with you. Um, and, and with the cost of, of hotel and, and travel and eating, I mean, it, 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 it adds up really fast. It, it can add. Fast. And 
and it really made a little bit on Saturday kind of put me in a, in a mood. Um, not a, not, you know, I wasn't depressed really, or just down about it, but you know, it did, it was kind of a, an awakening moment where it was just kind of like, man, these things are, 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 are really expensive. And, you know, Kevin Kreese and, and the living dead museum, um, they do a fantastic job with living dead weekend. Um, and they work, work so, so hard. Um, those those guys are just constantly running around doing everything, and they have a good crew. And that, that's the cool thing about everybody there that's even working there, you know, helping at booths and taking tickets and, and stuff like that. Is they're all fans too. Um, so this really doesn't apply as much to Living Dead Weekend because even the prices for autographs at Living Dead Weekend, like the biggest, guy, you know, the biggest uh, gets there were of course Galen and 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 Scotty and Ken, um, and they were still forty bucks. Um, which yeah yes and and to look back on it now and there you know there are a few reasons why this is the case but looking back on it now my first convention was in 2008 and I met George Romero for $30 um and I met Scotty and Ken and 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 a bunch of people I got so many so many things and and that was back when I worked a shitty job and had hardly no money and I'd just been saving like a thousand bucks just to travel to Dallas for you know a week or whatever it was and i still had enough money to just get all this other stuff and it's because it was like 10 bucks 15 bucks you know maybe ken was 20 bucks or something like that and yeah i understand inflation and stuff like that but i mean inflation hasn't gone up that much the biggest reason to me that i think that the prices have gone up is um walking dead um that show came along and and kind of it kind of screwed over the fans um when it comes to conventions but it was a really good thing for the uh, for the guests at these conventions because once the Living or uh, Walking Dead became a big um, a big get for conventions, prices skyrocketed because you had you know like guys like Norman Reedus charging out the ass, and then before you know it, <clears throat> they kind of it was it was kind of one of those things you know just to refer to wrestling for a minute. It was kind of like uh, you know when Bret Hart got his guaranteed contract with wcw like it kind of changed it's like when, when i guess that's just how it is in any sport football basketball whatever um somebody gets paid a lot of money it changes um it, it changes the floor for people it's like well you know uh, i was charging 20 bucks but i look over here and i see robert england is charging 80 dollars um i know i'm no robert england but you know i could probably charge 40 if he's charging 80 you know, and, and I, I don't know who I am hypothetically, but, you know, fucking whoever. Um, but, you know, that that's another good thing about Living Dead Weekend. It's still cheaper than most. Like if you go to Horror Hound or something like that and you want to meet, you know, like Robert England or, you know, I know the cast from Scream was at the, uh, the Horror Hound I was at a year and a half ago or something like that. <clears throat> and, uh. I think they were 60, 70 bucks a piece, something like that. I don't, I don't quite remember, but the prices have just gotten kind of just got a, just kind of a little outrageous. And and now it's really strict where it's like you have, you know, it's per autograph. You know, back in 2008, Romero was 30, 40 bucks and he'd sign everything, take a picture. You know, he would sign anything and everything you brought. You buy something off his table, and then you have other stuff for him to sign, and he would sign it. Um, and yeah, like I said, Walking Dead came along, kind of changed the whole pay scale on everything. Everybody else started charging more, and it's just it's just the norm now. It's just kind of how it is. Um, but there were plenty of uh, people at the uh, Living Dead Weekend that were um, only charging twenty. Tom Dubinsky was only charging ten bucks for an autograph, and I thought that was amazing I, was, I looked at him i told him i was like you know that that's 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 a steal and he was like yeah but i mean who am i you know and he's you know very very cool humble guy <clears throat> he was just you know just glad to be there and, and he was also at the martin screening um on saturday as well um just a wealth of knowledge if i could ever get him on the channel uh, just for an interview we could probably go for three or four hours um if, if he would let me um because you know any question that I'd have, I feel like he probably has an answer for. Um, but yeah, I, and I think it really hurts the vendors a lot too. Cause that was one thing I noticed about this as well. Is that there were so many, especially the being a 45th anniversary of Dawn of the dead and kind of a reunion. Um, 
there were so many people that I wanted to get signatures from and I had uh, multiple things for certain people. And, and I, I'm not, that's the thing I think too, is I'm not, I feel a little awkward um, when I go up to a table and, and, and somebody that I really respect and, and really, um, and, and really like, and, and you lay something down in front of them and it's like, Hey, can you sign here? I get it. That's why they're there. They're making money, you know, and I'm, you know, most of the time they're having a good time. There are a few exceptions, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I, I still just feel a little awkward. Um, I know uh, Grande shared a story. He met John Amplis over the weekend and apparently they had a, a good long conversation and, and John Amplis wouldn't take any money. He was just like, nah, don't worry about it. So uh, Amplis is, is always really cool about that. Uh, as is uh, Mike Gornick. Uh, I had another good conversation with Mike Gornick while I was there. Um, <clears throat> specifically about that black and white two and a half hour Martin cut. Got some really good news on that. Uh, some stuff that I thought was probably the case, but um, uh, Gornick pretty much all but, uh, um, you know, all but confirmed. That's what I'm thinking of. God almighty. Um, but yeah, I, and I like I, like I was saying about the vendors, I think it, it's kind of, it kind of screws them over a little bit. Um, because I mean, you only have so much money. I mean, I, I can't imagine, you know, they, there's so many people there that they probably had a certain amount of money they could spend and they had to, you know, I want to get Galen. I want to get Ken. I want to get Christine. I want to get Richard France. But any more than that, I mean, shit, you're looking at three over 300 bucks. You know, I, I spent almost 400 and I, I didn't get nearly anything. I didn't buy anything from any vendors either. Um, and I don't like that. I, I, there was so much there that I wanted to, so many good vendors. There was, you know, um, of course, Doodles of the Dead, Dan Lowry. I mean, uh, his table is just, I could stand there and look at that shit forever because he's just got just all kinds of uh, Romero collectibles and Romero artwork and, and, Blu-rays, DVDs, anything and everything. And uh, I, I, I could spend a thousand bucks just at his table alone. But, uh, but man, after a while, it just starts adding up and you got to want, you got just got to think, I think what I'm going to do from now on, because I've pretty much, <clears throat> I've pretty much gotten every signature that I kind of want at, at this point. I mean, of course, there's a, there's a, a few exceptions. I mean, David M. Gee, uh, if he ever was able, which I'm I pretty much uh, talking to uh, Dan at Doodles of the Dead booth this year, um, he was looking at a David M. Gee autograph that he had for sale. And we just were just talking about, you know, whether or not he would ever do one again. And and, and pretty, it's, it's like a 99.9% .9 chance that he will never be able to do another convention or anything ever again. He's kind of, uh, in assisted living, I believe, um, his health doctors will not let him travel, uh, is pretty much what, what we've heard. Um, so I don't think that'll ever be the case, <clears throat> but I, I think next year, if I go next year, it's going to be mostly for the vendors. Um, there's so much, so much there to look at, check out. Um, there's so much that I, I mean, God, Bob Michelucci's table, um, he had so much cool shit. Um, J.R. Book Walter, uh, his table, he had so much good shit. Um, uh, George Demick, um, he had a lot of really, really cool shit. Um, and there's just so much you, you but you gotta just, you gotta pick and choose where you're spending your money. Um, so I can't imagine people that are just, you know, really, really on a budget trying to, you know, trying to decide whether you want to buy something from this vendor or you want to go get Renee Banks's autograph or something, you know, um, it, it's tough. It really makes you choose. But I mean, that's just kind of, that's, that's the climate we live in now um, with these horror conventions. Um, I can't imagine. I mean, that, when I went to horror hound, I really went for like two or three people and I ended up buying, I think I got the Suspiria 4k from synapse. Um, but other than that, I mean, and then I, I still spent a couple hundred bucks. Um, but at that convention, I really just went to meet uh, Gornick, Amplis, um, Daryl Ferrucci was there. Um, there was like a handful of signatures that I wanted. And then uh, that was also where I met Adrian Barbeau and Tom Atkins. Um, so, yeah, by the time that whole thing was over, I'd spent four or five hundred, four or five hundred bucks on, on autographs in general. <clears throat> so it, it's it's. I, I get it. That's just the way it is now. But there, there's a big part of me that that really misses, um, 
just just kind of the more free and, and open. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I will say that Living Dead Weekend is definitely of of the conventions you could go to in terms of price wise. It's definitely the most uh, most cost effective. Um, they're they're not uh, they're not there bending you over backwards and <laughs> taking your lunch money. Um, so that was good to see, but uh, seeing like, oh, damn, Galen's only charging 40 kind of reminds you, it's just like, oh, only 40, <laughs> that's a good price for now. Um, but I don't know, 10 years ago or so would have, would have been a completely different story. Um, but yeah, met, uh, got Galen's autograph, got, got Scotty's, I got his on a couple more things. I met him back in 2008, but, uh, um, <clears throat> had a few more things for him. He was, he was really cool. Um, I hope he's doing okay. I saw he was in a wheelchair most of the weekend. So, um, I'm, 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 hope, I'm hoping he's okay. Um, uh, let's see who else. So yeah, I met Christine first Saturday <clears throat> went in first stop was Christine Romero. That was a little surreal for me because I've always been a huge admirer of her and, and her work with, with George and, and and she was really she was there right by his side for most of his biggest films from Martin through Bruiser pretty much <clears throat> excuse me and she had an, and she was tied to Season of the Witch as well i think the house that they shot they used for Season of the Witch was her parents house i believe and i think she was away at college at the time so her and george hadn't really met at that point um but yeah, she, her and George went, went way back. Uh, but it was it was really really special meeting her. I was able to tell her how much I appreciated everything that she had done, and she looked really really touched by that. And um, and she just kind of it, it kind of she kind of made it um, pretty apparent, um, you know, her feelings towards George. Now um, she does miss him quite a bit. Um, she, she she told me that she when they were going through their divorce, probably early two thousands. Um, and, uh, what the hell was I saying? <laughs> I got sidetracked again. If I'm just trying to go back and then relive the, the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, her and George went through a divorce in the early two thousands and, uh, you can tell she was still really affected by it. Maybe not really. If I mean, she's, it's not like weighing her down or anything, but, um, but she, she, you know, was like, you know, I was, I was shocked, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared. I didn't see it coming, you know, and it just kind of did, but you know, she was really appreciative and thankful for that. Everybody, you know, she was very thankful that anybody was there to, to see her. I mean, she was genuinely touched by that. And, um, but she was, she, we, we went into a, you know, she was like, yeah, I always tried to get George to, he, to quit smoking and, and take better care of himself. And he just would never listen. You know, George was always very anti taking care of yourself. And I was just, I had to laugh. And I was like, yeah, I, 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 I can't say anything. I smoke too. And she just looked at me sternly, just kind of leaned in and looked at me. And she was like, stop it. Like, it was like I was being chastised by Christine Romero for a second. And I was just like, Okay, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Romero. I'll quit. It was like being chastised by your mom or something. It was weird. But uh, she was she was really nice, really sweet to meet. Um, then after her, I met Tom Dubinsky. Um, actually, after meeting her, I had to step outside and smoke a cigarette to uh, <laughs> take in what just happened. Um, but then I met Tom Dubinsky. <clears throat> um Talk to him a little bit, just just uh, thanking him for for luck. Because I remember he he, if you go check out the uh, Garf Network uh, YouTube channel, he did some videos with Matt Blasi and Eric Kent um, on there where they were going back to some old Martin locations and, and just his his memory and, and and I mean he's it's it's like his his brain is a journal that he can just kind of flip to different pages and be like okay uh, yeah so when we did this we shot here and and. You know, the, the uh, you know, the sun was going down. We didn't have enough light, so we had to shoot it as fast as possible. So if you're looking at, you know, just list every minor detail. Um, so he, like I said, he was only charging 10 bucks for an autograph. I was just like, you should be charging more than that. You're you're one of the most important pieces of this puzzle. Um, 
He was just like, yeah, it's fine. Um, then I talked to Mike Gornick. It was kind of a row there. I was kind of going down the, you know, kind of going down the row there. And then um, stopped by Gornick's, um, talked to him for a second about that Martin Langwaika, which, which got some really, really good news on that. Um, apparently, Greg Nicotero was the one who ended up purchasing that print um, for about fifty thousand dollars. From from what Michael told me, it was a, a cash offer, um, straight up. I'll get fifty grand for it right now, and and they took it and they accepted it. Um, so then he donated the film to the um, to the Carnegie Museum where they they have a, is it Carnegie or University of Pittsburgh? I think it may be the University of Pittsburgh. Right off the top of my head, but um, it's where they have the Romero archive now. Uh, he donated it to them so they could uh, transfer it. Um, first, they looked at it. Apparently, the print is still in, in very good shape. Um, he was very thankful for that, as am I. Um, the print's still in, in very good shape. It's been currently in the process of being transferred to digital. Um, so anybody who wants to watch it can go to, to the university, to the archive, and, and watch it. Um, so we'll, whenever that becomes available, whenever that becomes a thing, um, I'll probably be taking another trip to Pittsburgh, uh, which I need to do anyway, I, which the archive is available if for people to, to visit. You don't have to be a student at the college. Um, you don't have to have anything, really. Um, <clears throat> from my understanding, uh, all you have to do is email, call, let them know, you know when you want to come, what time. And, uh, and and you can go and view it, and it's it's a complete archive of everything that uh, Romero kept from over the years. I mean, there's props and uh, sh screenplays that never got made, shooting screenplays for films that did get made, um, <clears throat> just tons and tons of stuff that, that that he accumulated over the years is available in this archive to view. Um, and now that this print of Martin is also going to be included in that. Um, I, I'm going to have to make a trip and just, just for that reason alone, just to go to that archive and spend the day just looking through shit. Um, and I'm sure if you want to look at all of it, it'd probably take longer than that. So, so that's fantastic news in terms of <clears throat> any kind of uh, release or any kind of distribution or, uh, or public uh, exhibition of the film. I don't think that's in the cards right now. Um, from what uh, Gornick told me, Richard Rubenstein was was very cool about um, him, uh, Nicotero donating it to the uh, to the archive, and, and people and very cool about having people go and, and view it. Which, you know, I mean, what, 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 yeah, it's Richard Rubenstein. He, there's a chance that he would say no, um, but I, I'm very glad that he's he's very cool with it. But he, I, from what I understand, there is no plans, no, um, no real. <clears throat> in terms of a release or anything like that, I don't think Rubenstein is really interested in doing that at this point. So I don't think that will, as of now, that could change, of course. Um, <clears throat> but as of now, the only way that, that people will be able to view this is at the archive. Um, I hope that changes. I would love to see a, um, you know, uh, somebody get a hold of that. I'd love to see Second Sight do another release of that. But, I mean, they just did one, so I, I doubt they would spend the money to do another release of the film. Um, but I think here in the States, um, you know, if somebody like, uh, if Synapse got a hold of it, I think that would be a perfect fit for, for something like like that. Um, or Criterion, fuck. <laughs> Criterion get a hold of it, shit. Put out a Criterion release of it. Um, <clears throat> I think it's that kind of film. And, uh, so yeah, so yeah, that's good news. It's, it's not the best news. I would love to hear, oh, there's going to be a 4k release of it or something at some point and you can own it and watch it whenever the hell you want. But, uh, the fact that the, the print was in good shape, it's being transferred as we speak and will be available for, for the public to see at the archive. Um, that is good news. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so yeah, got that bit of good news from Michael Gornick. Uh, met Tasso uh, briefly. Um, he he was he was very very cool. I mean he was you know he 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 made me take a picture with him, which I'm not a huge fan of of, of taking pictures. Um, forever just just a little. I don't know, man. I <laughs> I try not to fanboy out uh, too much at these things. Um, <clears throat> I I just. 
you know, especially with like, like I was going to mention earlier with Tom Savini, I feel like Tom is such a, uh, such an interesting and complex guy. I've heard, I heard so many, so many stories over the weekend of people meeting Tom and being disappointed, um, which is kind of the MO that he's had uh, over the years. I just think, and and it's it's like I it's like I've mentioned before. I think on on Grande's stream a couple uh, a couple of nights ago, <clears throat> I just think Tom is much cooler if you meet him outside of a convention setting than at a convention setting because I just feel like there's this this thought in his head that all oh, these people are just want me to sign this so they can turn around and sell it on eBay and make money off of it. But I mean, Tom is super cool about. It. I mean, I didn't go to his table this year, but I know usually. He just charges 20 bucks and he'll sign anything and everything he's got. So he's still old school in that way. But I just think he's such a, a complex guy. I mean, he's an he's he's truly an artist in the truest sense of the term artist. Um he's just such a complex guy that uh <clears throat> I, I think he may be just a little uncomfortable with people coming up and, and kind of talking about how much they enjoy his work or I, I don't know. That's just my theory. Um, I just think he, he's, he's a deep, deep guy in a lot of ways. And, 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 you know, some people are just not as outgoing as others. Um, I can definitely identify with that. You know, there are times where I just want to be kind of, you know, just want to crawl up in a ball and hide somewhere. But, and I think Tom may just be that kind of guy. Um, you know, when he's, you know, when he's on stage or doing a Q and a or something like that, I mean, he's, you know, he, he's fantastic or he's doing an interview or, you know, commentaries or stuff like that. But I just think that, uh, you know, face to face communication with him, with somebody that he's not, uh, doesn't know, not familiar with. Um, and I can, I can identify with that. It could, it could make you a little uncomfortable sometimes. Um, but he doesn't seem to fucking mind. I mean, he does a, pretty much any and every convention that asks him to come. So <clears throat> I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a weird, weird case, but, uh, well, let's see. Um, met Richard France. Uh, he was, he was very, very nice. Um, uh, you could tell he was just, you know, kind of in awe, like, why am I here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> just, it was kind of not in a way of like, what am I doing here around these people? But just kind of like, I can't believe it's been 45 years and I'm here signing my autograph for something for a small role I had 45 years ago. Uh, but he was he was so, so nice about it. Um, very personable, a um, little hard of hearing. Um, but other than that, he still looked in, in, in very, very good shape. Um Let's see who else did I grab over the weekend? Of course, um, Scott and Galen, both very, very cool. Galen was very personal with everybody that shit that came to her table. Um, took pretty much took pictures with pretty much anybody and everybody. Um, the one person that I did not get to meet, and I really regret this now because I was there Friday, but. By the time I the, the convention had opened at two o'clock, I'd get there around, probably around three, four o'clock. I was pretty fucking beat um, from just traveling Evan City. Then I went to Mars to look at some uh, crazies location. Um, just kind of doing a little bit of a little bit of everything that morning. Got up early and, and the adrenaline was flowing. And I think it was kind of wearing off by about three or four o'clock. So by the time I got to the mall, I just kind of got there and I was a little nervous. I was kind of having a a weird. Uh, almost panic attack at times where it was just kind of like, it was just a lot. It's really overwhelming uh, at first because you're going in, you're like, well, I'm in the mall. I'm in Monroeville mall. And there's all these people here that I've always wanted to meet. And there's so much to look at so much to do uh, that. I was just exhausted and drained um, by the time Friday afternoon rolled around. I hung out for the dawn, the, the three main characters uh, panel. They did the uh, group photo. And then I just kind of walked around, scouted, you know, see where everybody was placed and, and what everything, the, what the setup looked like. And then I watched about half of the Martin panel that they had on Friday. 
And then I was just like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this Night Riders screening tonight, so I'm going to be up late. And I already feel like I'm going to pass out on the floor. So I went back to the hotel, kind of laid down, took a little nap, kind of recharged the battery so I wouldn't, you know, just be a, a complete wreck by the time uh, Night Riders came on. Um, but that day I didn't get anybody, but I, the, apparently Tony Booba was only going to be there Friday. I did not know this going in. I don't know if anybody else did. I, I don't know if it was just kind of a last minute thing that he had to do. Um, but he was only there Friday. And I, when I went to find him on Saturday, could not find him anywhere. Um, now I know he was in charge of the screening that took place, uh, for Martin at the, uh, the Carnegie Museum of Art Saturday night. So I was like, well, he, I guess he's not here. I guess he's probably, um, I guess he's probably working to set all that up and get that all together. So, um, but apparently, yeah, he, Friday was his only day. Saturday, he was working busy with that. And then I guess Sunday, he was flying out to, to London. So, so yeah, unfortunately, um, did not get to meet Tony Buba. Did not get him to sign my Lightning Over Braddock Blu-ray. I really wanted to let him know how much I, I enjoyed and appreciated that film. Um, but hey, you know, hopefully there will be a next time. Um, but yeah, that, that's my one. That's the one that I regret not getting when I had the chance. Um, but that's pretty much everybody that I, I really got any kind of signatures or anything from. Um, I went to 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 find Warner shook a couple of times, but he was always up and shopping. <laughs> Funny enough. I swear to God, every time I turned around, I'd be walking through and I'd see Warner shook walking through the mall with a, a fucking uh, a bag in his hand coming from somewhere. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, other than that, um, it's a lot of fun. I had a lot of, a lot of fun meeting up with, like, a, like I mentioned, meeting up with Grande Saturday. We kind of walked around, talked, looked at shit, took a couple of photos with some with some cosplayers. and um, I guess that's what you'd call them, cosplayers. I don't know if I was going to cosplaying people or cosplayers, whatever they're called. Um, I like cosplaying people. That sounds robotic almost. Um, <sighs> distraction. What do you want? Pardon me, folks. All right, never mind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I met, uh, met Michael Felcher uh, on Saturday as well. Red shirt pictures. Um, got, uh, did get the lowdown on the Night of the Living Dead, or not the only, <laughs> the Nightmare on Elm Street box set for all you dead fa dead pit fans out there didn't get the lowdown on that but uh he i did mention bruiser if that was ever going to get a uh a blu-ray or 4k release and he did say that he just from what he's thinking and feeling right now just kind of gauging everything that's going on that uh it's probably going to happen sooner than later um no no real inside information or anything like that on his part but just kind of his gut feeling is that there will be something sooner rather than later for that for bruiser so so that was cool to find out, um, which if anybody would know, it, it would be Felcher. I mean, he works with pretty much every every distribution uh, boutique label that uh, that's out there at some point. I mean, he's pretty much done every documentary or uh, special, you know, uh, bonus feature on, on pretty much any God, any Blu-ray or even going back to the Anchor Bay DVDs. I mean, he was working on those back in the day. <clears throat> So uh, that was cool. Um, uh, met a fellow, another fellow uh, Dead Pit fan, uh, Ben. If you're watching, what's up, buddy? Uh, another, another cool guy. Um, and then I met with uh, Paul, um, who was outside. It was Saturday night. He was outside hanging out of the the Double Tree and I walked out there, and he was kind of cosplaying. And if he has a channel, actually, he does. Uh, he does that's uh, mostly musical stuff. It's it's Paul's synths and drums. Um, so check that out on a Blu-ray. He actually does a drum cover, a couple of drum covers of uh, some Dawn of the Dead soundtrack stuff from Goblin. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. Hung out with him, talked to him for a little bit Saturday night. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was cool running into some folks that I, I hadn't met before, but. Uh, 
<clears throat> had, had kind of mingled with on, on different Facebook groups and, and on here. And um, so, so that, that was definitely probably my favorite part of the entire trip was, was, was meeting new people. And, and it's always, it's just, it's, it's such a rare thing to meet people in, uh, in the world that, that have this similar interest sometimes, because I mean, there's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a very niche product, uh, Romero specific, uh, you know, fans that, uh, it, it's always really cool to, uh, to meet people. And like I said, you could just say, what do you think about, uh, what, what are your thoughts on creep show? I have a love hate relationship with it, you know? And then, and then you could go on a conversation about creep show for, for an hour. And, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so that's probably my favorite part of, of any convention or anything like that is just the, uh, the people you meet, the friends you make. And, uh, and of course, you know, I, like I said, I met my uh, my friend Matt at the uh, Living Dead weekend two years ago, and when he's been every year that I've gone, so it's always fun running into him and his family, and and uh, and just seeing what he's up to, and so uh, so yeah, it's just the community, the camaraderie that I, I think is the best part about it. Um, but yeah, I had a good time overall. Um, another small complaint that I, that, I, that I would have that, uh, I think me and Grande talked about on Saturday is that is the panels, the way that the panels are kind of set up, it's kind of hard to hear sometimes, especially for the older guests who may not be as, as boisterous as Ken Foray or Tom Savini. Um, it's just the way it's set up. I don't, I don't know if there's any kind of, uh, different layout in terms of like the speakers or anything like that, that maybe they could, uh, to switch around in the future or maybe put it uh, inside an actual uh, storefront like they did with the, uh, with the Knight Rider screening. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, at times it is a little hard to hear. Well, if, especially if you're sitting in the back, if you're up front, you're good. Um, but if you're kind of in the back, it's, it's a little hard to hear at times. It's just the acoustics of the area. Cause they hold it right there in the court where the uh, clock tower used to be, which is uh, where the Romero bust is now. <clears throat> And um, so it is a little hard to hear at times, for, especially for certain certain people um, when they're talking. And like I said, it's just the acoustics. It's a wide open spot. It's right there in the mall. There's all kinds of other noises and, and stuff going on around you. So it, it can be a little distracting as well. Um, so maybe in the future, um, I, I think it would be awesome just kind of have the way that they had the uh, Night Riders room set up <clears throat> to just kind of, which one one. Plus is that you can just kind of chime, you know, kind of listen in every now and then, even if you're up on the second floor, you, which is, you know, what I did a few times, just kind of stop, take a break and, and just kind of listen to what's going on down at the uh, at whatever panels going on, because there was literally a panel going on at all times throughout um, the entire convention. So so that part is cool. You don't actually have to go anywhere away from the actual convention and everything. But um but in terms of just being able to hear what's going on, um, it is a little difficult at times. So I don't know. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll figure it out in the future. Maybe they'll do something a little different. Um, I don't really know what else you could do to make it better in that spot because it is a, a great spot for 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 uh, for panels and stuff like that. Demonstrations. They did a Bob Michelucci squib demonstration. Um, there's a lot of videos on the on online of that right now. So that's really cool too. Um, but I don't know, maybe in the future, you know, maybe move it somewhere where it's a little more audible. Um, like I said, especially for the uh, the older guests, because, I mean, we're all getting we're all getting older and it's getting harder to, <laughs> to hear uh, in general. I know it is for me. I my, t my hearing is terrible. But um, so, yeah, and then Saturday night went to the. Um, the Martin screening that they had. And it, I was really, really hoping that it was going to be the, uh, the two and a half hour cut. They were just going to surprise us and, and be like, you know, we, we, we told you we we're playing Martin. Well, we are, but it's this black and white two and a half hour cut. So surprise. I want everybody to, you know, check it out let us know what you think and blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't, it was the original, the original version. They actually, um, I just put out. <clears throat> oh, right, I'm back. What was that? Me? 
All right, folks. Sorry if I go in and out here, but they played the 4K that uh, Second Sight just put out, um, and it was it was a, it was an interesting interesting. It was it was very different than the Night Rider screening. Um, there was alcohol available, but uh, there were people. It was more of a uh, a classier event, I guess you would say. It was outdoors. It was outside at the uh, at the museum. They had a big screen. Sound was was really really good. Um, the setup was was really really nice. The way they had it. Um, and and the mix the uh, the mix of the crowd was really really interesting because uh, half of the crowd was uh, Living Dead Weekend uh, people that were there to see Martin. So you had this crew of people coming in with like you know the black t shirts with like severed heads and shit on them or whatnot. <clears throat> and then the other half of the crowd were the art film fans that were there to see a film because they. You know, I guess they go to the school or they teach at the school or or they were friends of Tony Buba um, and were just there to to watch a film. And so it was that was a really that was a really that was one of my favorite things about watching George's films in a theater with other people is just to see to kind of pick out people and be like, OK, they've never seen this before. So I'm going to watch them and see how they react to this film and see how it still holds up. And uh so I, I'm, I'm a people watcher. I, I can't help it. Um, <laughs> it's so people are interesting to me. They, they, they really are interesting fucking creatures. Um, so I was watching, watching, uh, there was this three or four people right there in front of us. It was an older lady and then uh, an older man on her, on her. And I think the guy actually was one of the financiers that helped get Martin made. So I'm guessing he had seen it before at some point, but it had probably been years and years and years ago. Um, but I guess it was his wife next to him. And I don't know if she, I doubt she, she had ever seen it. And then next to them were, were a younger couple, but you could tell they were there just kind of having wine and, and just taking in, taking in a film. Uh, this is a, an art film, a documentary film and blah, blah. Um, so I loved that. I was watching them. And, and when they, they show the part where, Martin slits, uh, slits the wrist and the blood comes down all over Martin's chest and then all that. You could just see them just kind of look at each other like, what the hell are we watching? <laughs> what is this? And uh, it, was, it was it was interesting, though. It was interesting watching. You could tell uh, <clears throat> you could tell it was an interesting experience for, for, for those people. Um, because I think what uh, Tony Buba does is it's kind of a series of films that he kind of curates where they play something every month. Um, and I think usually it's like documentaries or, or art films or stuff like that. And, and this month was, was Martin. And uh, I had, or I had a really good time. It was really, really nice. It was a beautiful night, downtown Pittsburgh. Um, and, and, and of course you had a couple of beers while you're there and just and really, really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> like I said, Saturday night, um, Martin screening, and then came back to the hotel, uh, met with uh, met with Paul down downstairs, talked to him and, and uh, uh, Mark, and I believe his girlfriend's name was Amber. Um, just kind of bullshitting. It was late, and I was really going down for one last cigarette before bed, and and the party. I mean, they were just passing out beer and stuff down there at that point. <laughs> They had a cooler of beer just out there, just passing it around to people. So, yeah, it was a little party going on outside of the Double Tree that night. So, uh, so I hung out for a little bit, talked a, a little bit there, and then went to bed. Woke up the next morning. There's just, just, yeah, I was homesick, and yeah, I was ready to get home to uh, to the fiance and my daughter. And but man, there's just something really, really just blue and, and depressing. It's it's. The uh, post blues is, is a fact. My friend Matt put it the other day. Ah, uh, you fucker! <sighs> Internet is going in and out. It's like I'm at the double tree again. But uh, there's just something really somber about leaving Pittsburgh uh, because once you, it's like when you're coming into Pittsburgh, it's just it's like it's an excitement. It's like I'm here. You go through the tunnel and boom, there it is. There's Pittsburgh. And uh, <clears throat> there's nothing better to me than driving into Pittsburgh through Fort Pitt Tunnel, but there's nothing more just kind of 
just it's more of a bummer than driving out of Pittsburgh through Fort Pitt Tunnel, you know. Um, so Sunday was kind of rough. I was planning on doing this stream Sunday night when I got back, but by the I, I went to bed at like eight o'clock that night. I was asleep by eight o'clock. I was so worn out, just mentally and just just beat. Um, <clears throat> So I didn't want to come on here and, and literally be a zombie and, and uh, I was like, oh yeah, it was fun, which I don't know. <laughs> it's maybe what I've done tonight. It was cool, man. Um, but yeah, it was just something it's, it's, it's really, it's really a bummer leaving Pittsburgh. It's like I, you drive into Pittsburgh. It's like, I'm here and, and there's everything lies ahead. And then when you're leaving, it's like, well, that was fun. Ah, back to the real world. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, like, like I said, definitely planning on, on taking another trip up there at some point to visit that archive and watch that, uh, two and a half hour cut of Martin. Um, don't know when that'll be. Uh, it could be next year. Could be, you know, who knows? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm losing my voice. But, um, but yeah, it was definitely a good time. Uh, Good, good meeting with a lot of people for the first time, and 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 hanging out with Grande, and and, and meeting, you know, the the guests, and letting them know how much we appreciate them, and uh, you know, seeing Night Riders on a big screen, seeing Martin on a big screen, and it was just one of those weekends where it was just like so much happening and happening at once. It was like it was hard to kind of all take in and let it sink in. I'm glad I waited until tonight to do this stream so I could kind of let it sink in and and, and kind of give myself a chance to process everything that went down and, and, and process how I was feeling about it. And, um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, good times for sure. Uh, got some comments here from Grande. I didn't mean to ignore you all night, brother, but, uh, <laughs> I was trying to just kind of play through what all I wanted to get out in my head before I forgot it. Um, let's see. It's like an abandoned forever 21. Yeah, I sat in the closet while I watched it. They were playing on TV, but it was too loud to really watch that. Yeah, I mean, it was even in the actual screening room, it was still pretty, pretty loud. It was kind of hard to tell what was going on in some of the quieter scenes, which, you know, for somebody like me who's seen Knight Riders 50 times or whatever at this point, like it, it, was, it wasn't as bad, but. Uh, they actually asked before the screening if anybody had not seen Knight Riders before. And there were a few people in there who hadn't seen the film before. Um, <clears throat> so some of the more quieter dialogue driven scenes were, were a little harder to, to watch, but, um, um, but by the end of it, I mean, I pretty much everybody had cleared out, uh, by the end of it. And, uh, it was, it was pretty, um, it was, it was a perfect time for that to happen. It's like, yeah, you, you can be a little rowdy at certain times. Cause I mean, it's a movie about people jousting on motorcycles. I mean, it's not, uh, you're not watching a, a Bergman film or something. Um, but by the end, which is one of my favorite endings of any Romero film, I think it's borderline the perfect ending uh, for that film when uh, Ed Harris character, spoiler alert, uh, when when he dies and they're at the funeral uh, out by his gravesite and it's raining and, and Donald Rubenstein's playing if I were uh, not if I were. I'd rather be a wanderer if I were a wanderer, if I were a wanderer. No, I'd rather be a wanderer. Um, that whole scene is, is so emotional and 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 especially once once the dust is cleared before the, before even that happens and and king billy kind of hands over the crown to morgan and and the whole passing the torch and changing of the guard and it's such it's, it's, a, it's such an emotional scene i think tom savini that may be the best performance that he's had in any film ever was that scene uh where he gets the crown and, and just starts crying and and it's like Luckily, it had quieted down at that point to where you it, that that scene and that whole ending kind of played like it should have, and uh, so so that was nice. That was really really cool. I left that that movie just walking. I was just like, man, I love that fucking movie. It's such a good movie. Um, yeah, they married in seventy one, and uh, actually, they didn't get married until they got married on the set of Knight Riders. Um, so they didn't get married until 1980. They may have met. I don't remember specifically. I'm guessing they probably did meet on the set of uh, season of the witch because um, that's where they shot. It was, like I said, uh, Christine's parents' house. <clears throat> so I think they met in 71, but then they didn't actually 
get together until Martin. Uh, George was still married to his previous wife, Nancy, um, when they were filming Season of the Witch. Um, and then I think they met on Night Riders. Uh, it, they went, they, uh, Christine went through it all in the, uh, you know, Night Riders, but Martin, uh, she went through it all on the Martin 4K, the special features on the Blu ray, the documentary that's on there, which is a fantastic documentary. I did the review of that a couple months ago. And uh, I can't I can't recommend that uh, documentary enough. It's it's pretty much a full length documentary on on the making of Martin, and uh, and they, she kind of went into the whole story of how they met and and all that, and uh, and it was right around the uh, the time of Martin. Um, so I think I think the story goes that she met George, but then they kind of split off, and George went and did his thing. And I think she was going to college at the time, and then they kind of just reconvened right around the time of Martin. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, duh, duh, duh. I guess you're referring to Savini. I avoided him, didn't want to be disappointed. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> like I said, Savini is uh, an interesting, interesting guy. He, he's a complex character. He's an artist. He's, it's like I said before, it's, he's one of the special people in, in this world. Um, he's so creative and, and there's there's so much going on in terms of of what he what he can do he I, I don't know the best explanation i can give is that he's just not much of a uh a personable one-on-one -on -one people person i guess i don't know but i guess if you're that way he uh, you wouldn't want to do conventions all the time but he does do conventions pretty friggin often um so I don't know. I've I, like I said, I've met him quite a few times, and yeah, the first time I met him, it was it was a disappointment. Um, he shouted me down. <laughs> it's, it's, I told the story about the, the Q and A session. It was the first like panel Q and A I'd ever been to. It was him and and Nicotero, and uh, and they were like, okay, well, let's ask, let's let's get some questions. And and me never being to one of these things before, and just being nervous as shit because I'm talking to Tom Savini, one of my heroes. And I'm just like, uh, what was it like working with Joe Spinell? Just shouted it out. And he just looked at me and was just like, raise your hand. <laughs> so now I can say I've been chastised by both Tom Savini and Christine Romero. Um, so I, I, I'll take that. But yeah, and that, that was just like, oh, man, Tom just shouted me down. He just shot me down, shot me down. But I did raise my hand, ask question. He did answer it. But and then when I met him at his table, he was kind of a dick, it seemed like. I don't think it was just me personally that he was just like, oh, you're that guy that just blurted out, you know, that question about Joe Spinell. I just think that's just how he is. I, I don't think he means anything negative by it. I just think that's just his demeanor. I don't know. <clears throat> it's really hard to tell with some people. But that was the thing, too, about it. pretty much everybody else at that convention was uh, having a good time and in good spirits and, 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 and really, really nice. Um I didn't see anybody. I don't recall seeing anybody just kind of sitting there with their arms crossed, just kind of, yep, I'm here. Somebody going to come ask me for my, everybody was kind of, it was kind of hard to catch some people because they were always kind of up and around talking to people, having, you know, uh, you know doing panels. And <clears throat> so there was always something going on. And yes, I would mark out for a bruiser Blu-ray as well. I think it would look beautiful on 4k. I think that, just the way that that film shot. Um, I would love to see a 4K of that. It's owned by Lionsgate. Lionsgate has the rights. Um, I know Lionsgate has worked with uh, Vestron in the past, so it may be a Vestron release, would be my guess. That's what Felcher said at the convention. That he, he would like it to be a Vestron release, um, <clears throat> which would be fine with me if they did a Vestron 4K or even a Blu-ray of... Um, of Bruiser, I think that would be uh, fantastic because Vestron is not a very expensive either. They they put out, I know when they did the uh, they did Silent Night, Deadly Night three, four, and five, uh, a three pack. Which I mean, yeah, it's Silent Night, Deadly Night three, four, and five. So it's not like you're getting fucking you know <laughs> the greatest films of all time. But it you know that's usually something that if a Vinegar Syndrome or somebody did that, it would be a fucking sixty seventy dollar purchase. <clears throat> which speaking of, uh, before I forget. Severn had a table there, and um, if you're an Argento fan and, and you didn't get a hold of one of those Four Flies on Gray Velvet 
4Ks that they just put out um, because they were sold out or, you know, the, the window had closed for people to be able to buy them. They had those there, along with the Five Days in Milan, the uh, the long lost Argento film. And uh, I was really, really this close to, to buying them, but uh, but I just couldn't spend. I mean, we're looking at we're looking at ninety bucks, I think, for for those. I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. It's it's ridiculous. But um, but yeah, like Vestron. If a Bruiser came out on Vestron, it'd probably be a fifteen fifteen dollar um. Blu-ray, maybe twenty dollar four K. I don't know. Um, so that would be cool. I, I would like that. I like Vestron's done some good stuff in the past. There were a Shivers release, Cronenberg Shivers. Um, I picked that up when it came out, and I, I think that was a really, really well done Blu-ray. Um, so I'd, 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 I'll take Bruiser. I don't give a fuck who puts it out. Mill Creek could put Bruiser out. I'll buy it because literally the only release that we've had in the states of Bruiser, other than the VHS, is the DVD. Um, there's been no Blu-ray. There's been no four K. There's been nothing. And you would expect, with it being a Romero film, that somebody out there is willing to to get the rights and put it out because it's going to sell. I mean, just, people will buy it. It's it's a it's a Romero film, so just that alone. Even if people don't like it, people are going to buy it because there's just there's a whole subculture of uh, people that just fucking collect Blu-rays and 4Ks. It, it's insane. <laughs> so, and, you know, and a lot of people don't like Bruiser, and that's fine. But I guarantee you they'll buy the, the Blu-ray or 4K of it if it comes out. Um, that's right. He married Nancy Romero before season. Yeah. And I, don't, I really don't know too much about Nancy Romero. That that may be a stream or, or a video or, or something I do in the future is, is really dig in and try to find out more about Nancy Romero. You, there's, you can't hardly find anything on her online if you Google Nancy Romero. I think she may have done some other stuff in film uh, after her work, her time working with George. But other than that, there's really no other uh, real information about Nancy Romero. There, there's two uh, projects that I want to work on now that Living Dead Weekend's over and I got, uh, you know, got some other stuff coming up. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, uh, an unboxing and a review of the new vinegar syndrome release of effects um, that I picked up. It should be here. Hopefully by the end of the month, um, I look forward to that. I've seen effects one time and uh, it's one of those movies that I think is, is, is really interesting, has some really, really interesting ideas, but man, it, the, the, there's no budget on this movie whatsoever. And of course it's got a young Joe Pilato. It's got a young uh, John Harrison, who I think does a great job in the film. As a matter of fact, Tom Savini's in it. Um, it's kind of one of those Romero adjacent films that came out. I think I think they made that right after Dawn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Tony Buba was involved with it. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the Romero crew uh, helped help put that together. And of course, that was shot in Pittsburgh as well. Um, so yeah, I look forward to uh, checking that out. Uh, and, and doing some videos and some reviews of that. See, and it's vinegar syndrome, so I'm expecting it to be a pretty, pretty good quality. Um, now, I don't know how good it can look. I mean, it's like I said, it was a film with hardly any budget. Um, and I, I'm sure the, the the film stock that they shot on was not the greatest. So, um, so we'll see. I, I'm I'm really really curious. I know that it's been it had been released before on Blu-ray. Um, very limited uh, release. Um, I can't think of who put it out off the top of my head, but um, I, I, I've never picked that one up. So I'm excited to get this one and, and finally go back and, and rewatch it and see how good the transfer looks and um, and uh, and really reassess it. Because like I said, the first time I saw it, I was, I was like, oh, this is not bad at all. This is actually a really interesting concept. Um, I just think the, the main flaws that it has are, are budgetary. Um, uh so yeah, looking forward to doing that. Um, who, Matt, what's up, brother? Two parter for you: Crazies versus Martin. Which one you picking? Desert Island Romero film. I'm gonna assume Todd. <laughs> okay, um, Crazies versus Martin. I gotta go with Martin. Uh, Martin, I love Martin. I think that's um, there's just something about it. Uh, I love the 
sporadic. I love the locations, um, the performance by John Amplis, performance by Lincoln Mizell. I think the performance from Christine Romero, that's one of her best um, overall performances that she ever had in Romero Home. I love the crazies, though. I, I rewatched the crazies again not too long ago. And uh, especially after going through COVID and, and, and everything that, that, that went down during that time period. Um, <clears throat> it really sheds a big light that, God, George had this figured out 50 years ago, that this is how we would act uh, in this situation. Because <clears throat> in the crazies, the whole, the beauty of the crazies to me is that you don't know who the hell's actually infected and is actually crazy or is, or is just crazy from having to deal with the situation that they're put in the, the quarantine, the, uh, you know, the lockdown, you know, to use COVID terminology. Um, it, it mirrored that COVID time period so perfectly um, that you go back and watch it now and you're like, God, this is just spot on. You know, Romero had it figured out before anybody, anybody did. Um, but uh, yeah, I love the crazies. Uh, it's one of those, it, it's definitely up there, uh, with my, one of some of my favorite Romero films, but, but for me, Martin, I just think there's so many layers to Martin. There's just the atmosphere, the soundtrack. I love Donald Rubenstein's soundtrack the performances, the, the, you know, I, I just love Martin. Um, and then desert Island Romero film. I mean, yeah, it's, it's gotta be Dawn. <laughs> Dawn of the Dead is literally the one, the one film that I can watch at any time, and and be perfectly fine. Even when I and there's times where I'll just put it on to be background noise, and then halfway through I'm I'm just sitting there, completely glued to the screen watching it again because I'm discovering something new or I'm realizing something new or I'm seeing something new, something in the back, like tiny shit, like shit in the background that, uh, you know, I'm just like. I don't know. You, you just see like, oh, that logo there. And I love there. There are people out there like that, that will, you know, pick out the smallest little details of Don and be like, oh, my God, look, this c cigarette brand that they're smoking is this. And they'll go and find it on eBay. And, and I mean, that that's it's such a special thing about the, the film in general is, is the, the fandom behind it and just the people's attention to the details and, and uh, uh, you know. And especially, you know, when it comes to like uh, performances and stuff like that, I can go back and, and watch Dawn and, and pick up on different nuances in, in the screenplay and the performances of the characters. Like, I've done that a lot here recently, where, I, where I've really come to appreciate the performances of, of, of Ken Foray and Galen Ross and, and, and all those people even, even more. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely a hundred percent Dawn. I can watch Dawn of the Dead and talk about Dawn of the Dead till the fucking cows come home. Uh, I, I would be perfectly fine on. I, I would not be perfectly fine on a desert island. <laughs> I'd probably lose my fucking mind. But uh, I would I would survive a little bit longer than I would have if I didn't have Dawn of the Dead. Um, I could at least just watch that and and it, it's my happy place. It's it's where I go to to rest my brain and 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 enjoy myself. So. Uh, but yeah, man. Hey, good to see you, Matt. I'm glad, uh, glad to see you in here tonight. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, pretty much everything. I think, like I said, I've I spent the last day or so kind of going through everything in my head, trying to figure out, uh, you know, trying to compartmentalize everything and all my thoughts and feelings of for the weekend and, and just conventions in general and, and then, like I said, uh, you know, I was a little homesick. I got a little, uh, little bummed out just about the just conventions in general now. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, Living Dead Weekend. If you're a Romero fan, it's it's the convention to go to. Um, I don't know what they're going to do next year. They usually do a, a anniversary of some type. I know a the year before this year they did the Night of the Living Dead ninety reunion. Um, the year before that they did a. Uh, Day of the Dead and Return of the Living Dead reunion. Um, I don't know what what type of reunion they could do next year. We're talking 2024. Romero, when you think about it, I don't think he ever. I don't think he ever released or did anything in any year that ends in four or nine, or well, yeah. 
So you, it would have to be a weird, like, it would be like the 42nd anniversary of something, you know? Because uh, let's let's think about it. I mean, you know, Night of the Living Dead was the first film, came out in 68. Uh, which, you know, that that's this year. That's the uh, 55th year anniversary coming up. I think there's going to be a, uh, I'm pretty sure they're doing a Living Dead weekend in October for that as well in, up in Evan City. Um, but I mean, 74, Romero didn't do anything in 74, unless they want to do like, uh, 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 <laughs> which I don't know how they do it, but an amusement park reunion or something. I don't know. Um, so yeah, 74 wouldn't work 79. I mean, I guess, but I mean, I mean, I guess the consensus is that Dawn of the Dead came out in 78 originally, which it did in Italy in the States. I think it didn't come out until early 79, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> but we just did the Dawn of the Dead, you so you couldn't do that. And then 84, George didn't put anything out. That's kind of in between Creep Show and, and the Day of the Dead. Uh, 89, you think, I mean, I guess. <laughs> well, Two Evil Eyes. Was that 89? Ugh. No, nope, that's 1990, so that wouldn't work. Could do a Two Evil Eyes reunion. Uh, 95, George wouldn't do anything. 2000, well, no. So it'd be 94, George still wouldn't do anything. 99, George wasn't doing anything. We could have a 21-year anniversary. What? No, fuck, it'd be 26? No way. When did Bruiser come out? 2000, I believe. So it'd be the 20... 24 year anniversary of bruiser so i don't know if they're gonna do that either um so yeah i, I really don't know where they go next year or what the, what they plan on doing and, and like i mentioned earlier with return of the living dead sometimes they'll do kind of stuff outside of uh of romero uh so i, I don't know usually it's some some type of anniversary i know they did the uh 85 anniversary. Well, I think it's just whatever theme they want to go with. 990 was last year. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, that is true. I didn't think of that. Um, I don't know. What 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 is there left to be done? Uh, you know reunion wise i mean i would fully expect because this is also the 50th anniversary of the crazies so i'm 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 fully expecting them if they're going to have the convention up in evan city to uh to have some some cred which i mean i guess they just had richard france here so um, i could definitely see them getting uh lynn lowry bringing her to the uh living dead weekend in evan city this year um i'm not even sure who else is still around from the crazies uh I don't know. They may they may surprise us. Um, they just did a creep show themed reunion not too long ago. Day of the Dead. They just did. So I, I really don't know where they go. They've been doing kind of a Night Riders reunion every year because pretty much any film you do, everybody that was that ever worked with George pretty much was in Night Riders or worked on it at some point. So. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. It'll be interesting. We'll see what the, we'll see what they do. We'll see where they go with it. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't think I have anything else for tonight. I think uh, I think that about wraps it up for me. I uh, appreciate everybody checking this out. Grande, it was good seeing you, Matt. Good seeing you in here, man. Um, uh, I feel like there was something else. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, next, uh, next, um, next stream I'm gonna do. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what that's gonna be, but I got some stuff in the pipe. I'd like to focus a little more on uh, um, George as a filmmaker, uh, as opposed to just being, you know, the the horror zombie guy. Because uh, I think George as as just a. Cause I think, and I mentioned it a minute ago, just in jest, but I do have somewhat. That may be a good topic. Is creep show. I do have somewhat of a love-hate relationship with Creepshow, um, and I can get into why. I may do a video on that. Um, I just think there was something about that time period Creepshow. I think that was a turning point for George in his career. Um, there are parts of me. I love Creepshow as a film. It's fun. It's, you know, it's Stephen King. It's There's, there's so much to love about Creepshow. 
But I think in terms of, of, of as a filmmaker, I think it was a turning point in George's career where he became where he went from being a hot up and coming indie filmmaker and just became the horror guy. I think Creepshow kind of was the turning point for that. I think that's what kind of got him really pigeoned. Because, I mean, yeah, he had done Night of the Living Dead, which was a horror classic at that point. Dawn of the Dead, which was a huge success. But if you really look at George's films up to that point, he wasn't just a horror filmmaker. I mean, the really truest horror film that he ever made was Night of the Living Dead. After that, he did, you know, there's always Vanilla, not a horror film. Season of the Witch, which... I mean, they sure tried to sell as a horror film, but I mean, it was, it was originally called Jack's Wife. It was about a, it was a feminist film more than anything. Um, the Crazies, I guess you could call it uh, a horror film, but uh, to me, it's more of a, an action uh, sci-fi kind of film. I don't know. There's not really a monster in it. It's more of a, uh, it's it's like that film Contagion or something that came out, which is a horror. It's a, it's a horrifying situation that these characters are in, but it's not like a monster, you know, boo coming out of the darkness, scaring you type of film. Martin. Yeah. It's a vampire movie, but it's really more, it's really an art film um, about a vampire, about a kid who thinks he's a vampire, uh, a psychological art film in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. There's horror detail, but, but it wasn't just a straight ahead, um, you know, horror movie, um, Dawn of the Dead, even, even that, I don't even think is a straight ahead horror movie. It's not like, uh, like to me, the greatest horror film ever made was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I don't think anybody has ever come close to doing what that film did at the time, except for, I would put Blair Witch Project up there with it. Uh, just in terms of just being a cultural phenomenon and, and, and just completely rewriting the book on horror. Um, but to me, Dawn of the Dead is just more of it's 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 a action horror. It's a it's a commentary on society. It's it's just a there's so much more to it than just a horror film. And then of course, Night Riders is not a horror film at all. Um, and then Creepshow kind of comes along, and then that's when you see George kind of just become the horror guy because then he goes from creep. Because originally, I think the plan was he was going to do a film called um, Shooby Dooby Moon. Which was uh, which was a film that was written, I believe. I have a thing over here somewhere. It was written by uh, Richard Ritchie, if I'm not mistaken. But it was more of a uh, a sci-fi comedy or something at the time. There's not a lot known about it. I, I'm very fascinated by the film. That's another one I may want to do more research on and 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 discuss on a future stream. But but I just feel like Creepshow is kind of the turning point. Instead of doing the Shooby Dooby Moon or uh, or, or anything else, he, he kind of guy was like Stephen King wanted to do something with George, so they came together on this idea of Creep Show. It was a it, Creep Show is a very horror, uh, traditional horror film to me in a lot of in a lot of ways. And then when you you, you follow that up with Day of the Dead, and then I think it just kind of it, it became a point after you know, around the Monkey Shines, Two Evil Eyes, Dark Halftime, where it was like he was not getting offered the opportunity to make anything other than horror at that point. And I think that really, I don't know. I think he kind of resented that a little bit. He didn't want to be just a horror filmmaker. He wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, but uh, I don't know. I said, I was going to do a whole other stream on this, but I'm just kind of bullshitting at this point. Uh, I've been doing, but on here for a little over an hour and a half. Um, got another here from uh, Grande. Tried to sell Jack's wife. Like, yeah, it was, <laughs> It was a, the original shooting title was Jack's wife, and then the distributors, which were the people that was uh, Lee Hessel, I think. Who, who Canvassed Films was the name of the distributors, and uh, <laughs> and they were kind of in the business of doing like softcore porn at the time, and they were trying to go legit. So they distributed. There's always Vanilla and uh, Jack's wife. But they didn't like the title Jack's Wife, so they originally changed it from Jack's Wife to Hungry Wives. And there's actually it's, there's a funny fucking trailer for it, where the whole trailer there's just this I don't know what, what I mean what you'd call it this woman who's just kind of always saying Hungry Wives. And it's just like what the fuck is this? So they, I, I don't think they knew what to do with Season of the Witch. They knew George had made Out of the Living Dead, and they were trying to play off that. So they were trying to pigeonhole him as a horror filmmaker at that time. Anyway. Um, and I think that's why they went eventually with, you know, once it, once it didn't sell as a, you know, uh, soft core porn or whatever, uh, that's when they went with the title season of the witch, which sounded more horror, but, 
Um, and, and really just taken from the uh, the Donovan song that they use in the film, which is uh, uh, I'm a big Donovan fan in general. Um, that's another thing I'd love to talk about, too, at some point. Uh, if anybody has any ideas for future streams, let me know. Shoot me a comment or an email or, or uh, uh, anything like that. Um, but just if you have any ideas for future. But but another good uh, topic I'd love to explore sometimes is, is Romero soundtracks and, and scores from Romero's films because so many iconic scores and then soundtracks. George was never one to use a lot of popular music in films. Season of the Witch is one where he, he put Donovan uh, Donovan's season of the witch, uh, in a montage in that film. And then of course, I think that Marion faithful was on the, was used for the crazies. And, and I'm, I'm sure those were, it may have been George's decision to, to use those, but, um, I would guess it was probably a distributor thing where it's like, Hey, we, we can put this song in there and it'll sell more because people know the song or whatever. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Good seeing everybody tonight. I uh, had a blast over the weekend. Um, it's all kind of, I'm coming back down to reality, going back to work this week. Yesterday was rough. Not only did I have to go right back to work after driving eight hours home on Sunday, but uh, had a dentist appointment as well. So it's, it's been a, I got thrown right back into, uh, right back into the real world, but uh, I'm getting my feet back under me. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know what I'll be doing next. But uh, keep an eye out. We'll be doing something here soon. Got some more uh, Romero content uh, that I plan on putting up. A couple of commentaries um, that have never been available in the States. Uh, I'm going to put those up just because, hey, what the hell? And, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm almost at 100 subscribers, folks. So milestone number one going to be hitting. When I hit 100 subscribers, I'm going to do something special. I'm going to come here. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to come out here naked. And and we'll turn this into like an OnlyFans for one night only. All right, I'll do whatever you want. You just you just pay me a little pay me a little money, and uh, I'm a whore like that. Not really. Don't don't <laughs> don't worry. I will not do that. You, nobody you you will pay me to fucking put my clothes back on. It'll be fine. Um, but yeah, I'm done for the night. I appreciate everybody checking it out. You guys have a great rest of the night. Great rest of the week. And of course, as always. Stay scared.